B for me, your man, Louis T. Welcome to the command post. You know what it is. Post up and take command. I, of course, am your commander in chief, Louis T. Thank you for joining me. Mandatory mini camp day number one. It was highly anticipated because of the Jack Del Rio saga and, of course, the Terry McLaurin ongoing contract. Uh, and that situation unfolding and him not being present for mandatory minis, which is an option that he had. Uh, obviously, uh, mandatory means everyone's supposed to be in attendance, but we see this around the league quite often. Guy looking for a brand new deal decides to stay away from the team while negotiations are taking place. So this is not that different from a situation like that. Um, you can look around the league and, and everyone has an opinion on how these things should be handled. You've got some guys that are showing up that want new deals and then you've got other guys that are staying away. And honestly speaking, it's really uh, about preference and no two situations are the same. You know, they may look the same from the outside looking in, but no two situations are alike. So um, Terry's doing what he feels like is best for him in his situation. I got no, no, no problems with that. Ron Rivera pretty much said, and we're going to go through uh, the, the litany of guys that stepped up to the mic today and kind of talk about what was the biggest takeaway from each of those players and coaches uh, that spoke. So obviously the day was started off by Ron Rivera and Ron did the thing that he always does when there's a topic that he really doesn't want to talk about with the media. Um, he comes out, sets the table, says, hey, I uh, want to address something right off the bat. And then he lays it out there. And then when he's done with his statement, um, he says, hey, I really don't want to talk about this with you guys. So if we could just move forward, I'd greatly appreciate that. And then usually what happens after that is he gets five or six questions regarding the thing that he just said he didn't want to answer questions about. And then, you know, each media member tries to phrase it in a different way to see if they can get him to maybe say something that um, the last guy who asked the question uh, couldn't get him to say. Uh, and it did not work. Now, what they did get out of Ron was a history lesson on the Constitution and the Second Amendment and a, a bit of the first. Talked about gun control, and I don't know how we got to that point, but uh, needless to say, that was probably about three to five minutes of my life that I can't have back, which is fine. Um, I thought he tried to pull the old switcheroo. Hey, we, we're supposed to be talking about Jack here, but I'm going to slide in you know, the Second Amendment because, you know, the First Amendment kind of goes with that Second Amendment and that, that's a hot button topic right now. So maybe I'll switch it out. Maybe you forget that you even wanted to ask me about Jack. Didn't work, but uh, I applaud him for trying. So he essentially said the thing that I've said this entire time and I've been adamant about this. And this, I, I told you that we weren't gonna have to talk about this anymore. I lied. So this should be the last time, hopefully. But this is the problem when situations like what happened with Jack Del Rio arise is that it becomes a distraction. And that's what Ron essentially said. He said, I look, I didn't find him because of what he said. And I said that. I said, look, this isn't about what Jack said. I don't agree with him, but that's fine. A lot of the players on the team don't agree with him, which is why he had to address the team, which is what Ron said he did this morning before they went to team activities. He said that he addressed the team. It went well. He opened his door to players that wanted to continue the discussion and have dialogue. It was an open dialogue. And he said some players took him up on that. They sat down, they talked, and from all accounts, it went well on all sides. So that's good. Now, that's not the issue. Again, the issue wasn't what he said. Now, it could be in that locker room, but I told you until a player speaks out, that wasn't my problem. My problem was the distraction piece. And you saw it full force today because every single coach and player that stepped up to the mic had to answer at least one Jack Del Rio question if you were a veteran, okay? If you were a, a first-year guy or, you know, in the case of like a De'Ami Brown, they didn't ask him. He's not on the defensive side of the football, so they didn't even bother him. But if you were a defensive guy, no matter what, first year, second year, seventh year, if you were a defensive guy, you had to answer a Jack Del Rio question. And if you were just a veteran, doesn't matter if you were a, a defensive guy or not, you had to answer a Jack Del Rio question. And I thought that Ron did a really good job of getting his message across to the entire team. And we're not talking about this in the media. So when they ask you, because you know they're going to ask, you tell them, we handled it in-house. We talked about it. It's done. We're moving on. And that was pretty much the sentiment you got from each and every single player 
that the question was posed about Jack to they said the same thing to a man so you can tell that they talked about this and everybody received the message and they were able to go out and execute once those questions were fired away at them during these press conferences uh, throughout the day however you know Ron addressed it and said look the the fine and me talking to Jack and all of that stuff all that stemmed from the distraction not from what he said he's got the right to say what he said I'm, it's just a distraction. We don't need it. Ding, 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 which is what I've been saying the entire time. We don't need it. We don't need it. So it was addressed. He said, look, I had nothing to do with Jack, uh, you know, getting rid of his Twitter account or suspending activity there. Again, Jack, to, Jack wants to coach football. So um, we're going to move on and hopefully not really have to have these conversations uh, about Jack's, uh, you know, social media uh, activity anymore. So, uh, Ron also talked about Terry's contract, and that's the next thing, right? That's the next big topic. And he said, look, we, we want Terry. Terry's, he essentially said without saying, we're not trading Terry. Terry's not, like a lot of you are panicking. You know, you don't need to. And he, he's trying to quill a lot of your anxiety with the words that he's saying, because he can't come out and say, we're going to get a deal done, right? Because anything can happen. But he's essentially telling you, we're going to sign Terry McLaurin to a long-term deal. You have nothing to worry about. He said, we got this process started a lot sooner than we did with Jonathan Allen, and we got that deal done before training camp. So if we can get that deal done before training camp, and we started the dialogue with his agent a lot, lo a lot later in the process, we know we can hammer out a deal with Terry and his agent before camp gets underway. And he didn't actually say before camp gets underway, but he said, we expect him here before camp starts. He'll get enough reps with Carson Wentz during training camp. So that suggests that they should get something done. Now, again, even if nothing's done, they expect Terry to show up for training camp. So that wasn't him and, and this, uh, uh, essentially saying they're going to get a deal done, but they're going to get a deal done. And Ron said, look, we want him here. He's everything that you want in a football player on and off the field. And we're, we're going to get something done. That's essentially what he said about Terry. So uh, I'm not worried. Neither should you. I'm just telling you guys. And I know I've said that a million times, but a lot of you still are nervous. Don't be. This is going to get done. So um, really, Terry was the only guy not there. Deron Payne was in attendance. Um, and, and Ron talked about something else. And then we'll move on to the slew of players that stepped up to the podium today. You know, I, this is my favorite part of the offseason is listening to guys talk. I, you can't really glean too much from what's being done on the football field because nothing's being done in pads. Nothing's being done full speed. Um, everything is really mental reps, technique, things of that nature, getting the playbook down pat. That's what you're doing right now. It's less about the physical um, aspect of things and more about the mental side of it, you know, more about the technical side of things, which it should be this time of the year. But in, in saying that, you can't really gleam a lot from what's being done on the field. I want to know where guys are mentally. You hear that in their words. So we'll talk about all of the players that stepped up to the podium and what they had to say. But Ron's last thing that I thought was important that he, he mentioned during the course of his presser was Terry and Carson Wentz getting on the same page. And remember, there was a lot made of guys not being – you know, in the building all together for OTAs last year, especially specifically the, the secondary when Jack Del Rio talked about those guys not being there, you know, some of the guys coming on late, like um, like uh, uh, Bobby McCain. He remember we signed him late in the offseason last year. You had guys that, you know, weren't, you know, all up to speed. And so the communication wasn't there for the first half of the season. We had a lot of blown coverages, a lot of big plays given up in the back end. And a lot of that was due to a lack of communication. So they put a lot of emphasis on guys being at OTAs to get that camaraderie, to get that communication down pat. And so not having Terry there, you know, the question was posed, hey, is this a problem? You guys have made this an issue in the past. Is this a problem? He's like, no, because it's just one guy. We know Terry. We know Terry's a worker. We know Terry knows this offense, you know. So there, there isn't this, you know, disconnect. He'll get here. He'll get his reps in with Carson. They'll get on the same page. We got plenty of time between July and September to get those guys on one accord, so we're not worried. And I kind of feel the same way. It, it, would it be better if he were here and he were getting the reps with Carson Wentz? Absolutely. But at the end of the day, it is what it is. 
Terry's a smart guy. Carson's a smart guy. Those two will figure it out. They'll get in the reps necessary, whether it's extra time after practice, whether it's you know before practice or after practice or during practice. They'll get the reps in necessary to get up to speed and get each other where they need to be in terms of synchronicity so that when the season kicks off, uh, they'll be able to make some sweet, sweet music together. Um, and uh, I'm looking forward to seeing that relationship grow. I told you, I think those two are going to be two peas in a pod because of how their backgrounds kind of align. You know, two Midwestern guys, um, two guys that uh, I think have religious, heavy religious backgrounds, well-grounded, you know, individuals. I, I think they share a lot of the same core values. I think they're going to hit it off well once Terry finally gets here. So I'm looking forward for that. But uh, until it happens, um, all we can do is dream, 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 dream. But don't worry, it'll get done. So uh, you go to the players now, and Deron Payne is the first guy up. Um, and I, I told you I love Deron because Deron does not want any part. He's similar to Montez Sweat in the sense that he really could find any and everything better to do with this time than to be speaking with the media. Like, he is so disinterested in talking to the media that it's not funny. You can tell it's a, it's a chore for him. It's a task that he has to complete. But if he had it his way, he would not talk to the media. And, and, and really, that's a lot of players. But he, he and Montez in particular are really perturbed by having to share four minutes of their time with the media. That said, um, Duran was, you know, asked about his contract situation and why he decided to show up. He's like, look, I, lo I love the fellas. I love ball. I love being around them. I love the camaraderie. I'm here for all of that, man. So, uh, you know, I made the decision, you know, last week to not be here. I, it was voluntary. This one is mandatory. I'm here. Like, what y'all want from me? So uh, he's like, yeah, it is what it is. He really didn't have a lot to say in terms of his contract, he's like, look, I'm going to just go out and play ball. That's all I know how to do. He didn't have anything really to add to the Jack Del Rio situation. Like, look, I'm here to play ball. I don't really have nothing to do with none, none of that extra stuff. Uh, he talked about Brian Robinson and his relationship with him, for Darian Mathis, and some of the new guys on the defensive line. He's like, yeah, it's, you know, it's, it's a little different having some new dudes here, but it's all good. This is what this time is about, uh, getting to know one another, you know, getting on the same page, that kind of thing. He's like, you know, being having for Darian Mathis drafted, a guy at your position, and he knows for Darian Mathis, obviously, having gone to Alabama. He's like, you know, it, it doesn't necessarily change the fact that he plays my position. It's just, it is what it is. I'm cool. Like, it's nothing to talk about. And then, uh, he, you know, also talked about Brian Robinson and said, like, that's a dude that I really get down with. You know, he was from Tuscaloosa. You know, Deron Payne himself is a, is a, a down south guy. So they had that bond that they shared. And he said, like, he's like a little brother to me. So we spent a lot of time when we were both on the campus of Alabama. And now he's here. and We spent a lot of time with one another again. So, you know, he's one of my, my guys on the team. So uh, that's a relationship that I think will also help Duran as he continues his career here as a commander. We'll see for how much longer that is the real discussion with him. Um, you go to Logan Thomas. I think he's my favorite soundbite on the football team because – Logan Thomas gets it. That's number one. Um, he's very measured in what he says. He reminds me a lot of Terry in that regard. Very measured, you know, very conscious of what he's saying. But at the same time, he's going to give you the reels. Like, he's not going to pull any punches. He's going to tell you exactly how he feels. And it's going to make sense. You know, um, Logan is very aware of everything that's going on around him. And I, I just think he's a, a great interview. So uh, it's always good to hear from Logan. Uh, like I said, one of my favorite guys. Because I, I learn something every time he speaks. Can't say that about every player on the team. But I always learn something from Logan when he talks. So uh, first thing you want to know when, when it comes to Logan Thomas is how is he doing? You know, obviously he's coming back from the injury. And, and, and what he told me today was that the injury was a lot more complex than we were led to believe because initially we, we all just thought, oh, we tore his ACL, that was that. But he was like, when they actually got inside the knee, um, it was an a a a ACL, an MCL, and then they had to clean up a couple of meniscuses in his knee. So um, it was a lot of uh, damage done to his knee. And he's like, you know, uh, I'm about... 75% in terms of up, you know, running. 
Uh, he said, I'm, I'm going through the jumping phase right now. So, you know, we're moving along at a good pace. His target is still week one, you know, but, you know, we'll see if he's able to hit that landmark. Uh, but he's moving at a good rate, man. He looked good. Um, he was in great spirits. He talked about the tight end room. Remember, you know, we have a brand new tight ends coach um, in, in Juan Castillo. And he talked about, you know, knowing Juan, Juan and, and having worked with him when he was in Buffalo three years ago. So he's like, I, I know Juan. It's not a new relationship for me. Um, but also he, he talked about his relationship with our last, you know, tight ends coach who was outstanding. And he said, I still talk to him now. So um, he's like, I learned so much from him and, you know, kind of the confidence that I had instilled in me, I got from him. So, I, you know, I, I continue to, to carry myself in that manner. And he talked about the relationships of the guys in the room. And he said, man, they brought in a lot of guys that look like me. So that was funny because he's like, um, you know, Cole Turner looks like me, you know, I mean, big dude, long uh, athletic, can run routes, go get the football, which we all said he looks like Logan Thomas, uh, but he's probably a little bit more athletically gifted. I, it, we'll see, you know, because, you know, Logan was a solid athlete himself coming out of Vitek. So um, he talked about the uh, other tight ends in, in the room. He talked about AGG. He's like, I can relate to AGG making the position change. I was once that guy, you know making the switch from quarterback to tight end. He's making the switch from receiver to tight end. You know, he's tall, he's fast, he can catch. He's like, he just has to learn how to block. I can relate to that. So, you know, he talked about that. He talked about John Bates. He's like, yo, John Bates is a 10-year vet in a, in a second-year player's body. Like, this dude gets it. He came in here, he learned fast last season, loved John Bates, you know, and I feel like he's going to be ready to do big things this year. So, you know, he talked about Alex Arma, you know, a guy that we, you know, looked at as a fullback, but he's also running with the tight ends right now. And he's like, yeah, you know, everybody brings something different to the table. And it's an exciting room, you know. Um, I, the only guy I don't think he really mentioned was Sammy Reyes. But, um, again, he's like, I, I really can't wait to get back in the huddle. You know, I, I miss that being able to, to contribute. And then the thing that I loved is he just, he went off on a tangent, sort of like how I like to do from time to time and talked about the offense. And this was kind of unprompted where he just talked about all the weapons. He started with the tight end position, but he kind of found his way all the way, uh, all the way around the offense. I think it might've been a Carson Wentz question. And then he's like, yo, you know, we got all these second year guys, Bates and De'Ami Brown and, you know, Dax Milne and all these second year dudes that we see the develop and the growth from like you got Cam Sims, a guy that can step up at any time. But then, you you know, Terry's going to be here eventually and we know what he is. Curtis Samuel is healthy and we see all of the things that we can do and all the things that he'll unlock with this offense. And then you add in Jahan and this kid is a pro. It's a pro like this dude's ready to go right out of the package and this offense is going to be ridiculous, you know. Brian Robinson and Antonio Gibson. And so you could see him getting excited about the limitless possibilities of this offense. And when you just, and that's the thing that I get excited about. When you just take a step back, when you start listing all of the playmakers that we have, if we're healthy, and you start looking at all the possibilities of what we can do if these guys fit into this offense and we do a good enough job of getting everyone involved, <clears throat> you think about, what we can do offensively is something that we, we haven't really been able to say in Washington for a very, very long time, okay? We haven't felt this good about an offense probably since 2012 because, again, even with the Kirk years in 15 and 16, the run game wasn't a factor. Like, I feel like we can run the football as well. We haven't been able to say that we've got dynamic playmakers on the field everywhere probably since 2012. So uh, it feels really good to be able to look around at all the weapons that we may have in our arsenal if we go out and we execute and do the things that we are capable of doing. This, this team has a chance to be very dangerous. So he talked about that. And um, he talked about, you know, getting back out on the football field. And the last thing I'll say is he thought the hit was dirty that w was put on his knee. He didn't come out and say it, and he, he did it in a roundabout way because he didn't want to ruffle any feathers or cause any drama. 
But he's like, look, we feel a way about it here in this, you know, building. But it was a dirty hit. I, I told, I talked about it, and we see that same player this year. I'm not saying we're going to retaliate or we're going to do anything dirty in response, but I wouldn't be mad if he caught a nice little shot in his ear hole from our guard. It, you know, he's rushing up the field, and this is well within the rules, right? But I, I would love it if our guard just went hunting for Yannick Ngakwe. He plays for the Indianapolis Colts now. I'd love it if our guard went out of his way, Yannick's rushing up the field against the tackle, and the guard has nobody to block. I would love it if he would go and just ear hole him. I mean, just plant him and then just plop your 320-pound frame right on top of his ass, and then the tackle jump on top of you, and you put five or 600 pounds of mass on his punk ass. I would love that. But I'm not looking to hurt anybody. That's not my MO. That's not how I'm wired. But I'd love to inflict a little bit of pain. Anyway. Um, good to hear from Logan, and I think he's on schedule. We'll see if he's able to be back for week number one. Trey Turner, newest offensive lineman added to this team. Remember, we added Andrew Norwell first, and then we added Trey Turner later. He is penciled in as a starter right now, and, and if all things go the way that we assume they're going to go, he will be a starter at right guard. Uh, Andrew Norwell will be your starter at left guard and we'll have our starting five across the board. So um, he talked about being reunited with, you know, the coaching staff with Ron Rivera, uh, with his offensive line coach and, you know, all the things that uh, that brings. He's like, I'm, I'm nine years in, you know, and at this point I've been around the block a couple of times and I know that these are the guys that I work with the best, essentially. And so he's excited about. You know, building the camaraderie. I talk about that all the time and how important it is, especially on the offensive line, because that's a group that needs to work. Five guys working as one. So that's more so than any other group, positional group. They need to be on one accord. You know, they need to be in lockstep. So he talked about them going out and uh, doing things together. They went out and grabbed a bite to eat. He talked about them going to Top Golf and having an outing there and just really getting to know each other, talking about things that they've seen on the field and, you know, things that uh, they're going to need to be able to do in order for them to be the best possible unit that they can be. So uh, it was good to hear from Trey Turner. He seems to have a great personality and a guy that will fit in well in the locker room. And uh, hopefully he'll get back to um, the way he played when he was in Carolina uh, when he was making the Pro Bowl just about every year. And, and you know, John Masco had a, a big part in that. And we're assuming that him being back with Masco is going to do wonders for him. And he feels the same way. You know, he didn't really go out, you know, on a limb and, in you know, overdo it in terms of reuniting with Ron Rivera and, and John Masco. But uh, he, he pretty much said, look, these dudes are legit. I know what to expect from them. They know what to expect from me. And it just feels good to have some familiarity. So uh, good for Trey Turner. I'm looking forward to seeing if he can solidify that right guard position for us with no more Brandon Sheriff in the picture. Cam Curl, um, one of our favorite players on the defensive side of the football, just an unsung, unheralded hero on this football team, does everything for this team from a, a safety position standpoint. Um, going to be probably asked a little bit more of this year with no Landon Collins in the mix. Probably going to be playing a little bit of that Buffalo nickel role uh, as well as following around the other teams, you know, running back if he's a pass catching threat like he did with Christian McCaffrey last year when we played the Carolina Panthers. You know, they use him in a multitude of ways, blitzer, down in the box, away from the line of scrimmage, underneath coverage, you know, man to man against the other team's best, you know, running back, whatever the case may be out of the backfield. So there's so many roles that he occupies for this football team. Uh, he's a Swiss Army knife, and he's just getting better and better. And from day one, I loved his mentality. He was a guy that was a sponge, came in, soaked up all the information that he could, and that's why they could use him in the ways that they did as a rookie because he was such a student of the game. And you're seeing him continue to grow. And just listening to him talk, you can tell. He said, as soon as the schedule came out, I went and got my, 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 my uh, tablet, and I started watching film uh, on these – quarterbacks that we were going to play this upcoming season because I needed to see some tells. I needed to see some mannerisms and some things that I could take, you know, route, what route combinations they like to throw and things of that nature and what situations they like to go to this route and whatnot. So he's, he's just he's a student of the game, man. Like he's a sponge. He soaks it all up and he's like, I, I think I'm going to have a bigger role, you know, as, as a captain type of, you know, leadership role. And I'm OK with that. You know, um, you know, a, a, the more you play, 
and the more reps you get and, and the longer you've done this, guys start to look to you as one of the leaders. So, you know, I'm, I'm embracing that role if that comes my way. But um, I'm out here just trying to play ball and make plays. So uh, I'm looking for a big year from him. He didn't have an interception last year, and he kept talking about that last offseason, like, uh, or not last offseason, uh, going into the offseason this year. He was like, I didn't get any in- interceptions. So I need to make sure – I get my hands on the football. I think he will have some interceptions. I think he will impact the, the defense in, in a number of ways. And I think one of those ways, I think he's going to get his hands on a couple of balls this year, making some plays. So uh, Cam Curl is a guy that just continues to grow. He was asked about Jack Del Rio as well. Uh, and he, he did a good job. Like I said, all these guys that were asked about Del Rio did a really good job. Trey Turner was asked about Del Rio. of just like, look, we handled it in-house. You know, he manned up. He, he spoke to us. And, and we're moving on. So. Uh, Again, good job of Ron Rivera getting that message across to the players that we will not have uh, open dialogue with the media. We're keeping this in-house and we're moving on. Um, Jamin Davis. I love hearing from Jamin Davis because there are so many people out there that have already written this guy off using the B word. I won't use the B word because that's not my thing. You know, I I like to give the young fellas all the space that they need to grow because as I've said before, and I always talk about sports being a microcosm of life, everybody matures at a different rate. OK, I was a mature 13 year old. I, I got it. I was around a lot of older people growing up. And so I was a lot more mature. And I got buddies that they, they took them till 28 years old to have the light bulb come on for them to finally grow up. You know, it's some dudes I, I know that are still trying to find their way and, and grow up. And so everybody doesn't mature at the same rate. The same thing with NFL players. Some guys like Cam Kerr, for instance, they hit the ground running. They come out of the, the, the packaging and they're ready to go. No batteries or assembly required, okay? They already got everything they need. They jump in and they start making plays and contributing right away. And there are other guys that just need more time. They need time. And Jamin Davis was one of those dudes. They put a lot on his plate last year. They had him come in here and learn three different linebacker spots and then told him, hey, you're a middle linebacker. And, and just dropped it on his lap and said, figure it out. With no OTAs, by the way. You know, everything was really done virtually last year. So it was tough. It's tough for a young guy like that who hadn't played a lot of college football either. So he's a lot more comfortable. He said, look, man, I am light years more comfortable than I was a season ago. I can play so much faster now. And you know what it is? Like, he, he, he keeps downplaying, you know, playing middle linebacker. It, it really was him playing middle linebacker last year. It was a lot. It's a lot to play middle linebacker in this league. He, him playing outside – and allowing Cole to take all of those duties off of him, off of his plate, him not having to go out there, worry about what anybody else is doing except himself. Uh, It's great. And and as you grow in your role, then you can start wondering and and understanding, this is what the safety is doing on this play. This is what Cole Holcomb is doing on this play. This is what the defensive line is doing on this play. That's when you can start tapping into what everybody else's job is and how it affects yours. When you just get here, The only thing you're thinking, if you've ever been in a position like this, the only thing you're thinking is, what do I have to do on this play? What am I responsible for? So there's a lot of thinking. Now he's gotten to the point where he's like, less thinking, more playing, less being reactive and being proactive. And now I know what other guys are doing around me so I can play off of them. So he's like, man, I'm ready to go out here and show what I'm capable of doing. Or as he likes to say, playing Jamin Davis football. We're going to see if he can play some Jamin Davis football this year, but he seems like a guy that is in a much better headspace. You could tell last year his head was spinning. He didn't expect to be a first-round pick, not where we took him. And everything happened so fast. He went from getting drafted to then, you know, going to the racetrack because that was a dream of his, you know, and and having all this stuff. That These things don't happen when you're a fourth-round pick, your third-round pick. When you're a first-round pick, Things start to happen a lot faster. And then when you have an offseason that was compromised like we did, well, the entire league had a compromised offseason due to COVID. There was a lot going on. And it was hard for a guy like Jamin Davis to just come in, assimilate himself, and play the kind of football that he's capable of playing. And you saw flashes last year. Jack Del Rio talked about the splash plays that he made. And if you put up a highlight you know, tape of that, there, and I talked about a number of those plays. There were games he chased down Russell Wilson and hit him. Uh, Patrick Mahomes, he chased him down and made forced an uh, errant throw of him. We saw him make a, a hell of a stop on a fourth down against the Bills, sifting through traffic, getting to the running back, 
um, uh, Devin Singletary and tackling him for no gain on fourth and one and getting the ball back on the turnover on downs. There were plays throughout the course of the season where you go, if he could do that shit right there, bottle that up and do that over and over and over again, we got us a first round pick linebacker. So we're going to see if he can do that consistently. That was the thing. He was inconsistent as a rookie. Now with Cole Holcomb taking over inside and he just focusing on, on being an outside backer. I think that's the best thing that could have possibly happened for him. And I think he's going to flourish this year and I'm looking forward to it. And he sounds like he's ready to have a big time season. Uh, and then Deami Brown, another second year guy that we want to get excited about. They didn't really have a ton of contributions last season. Uh, there were a number of reasons as to why uh, we just talked about a lot of those things with Jamin Davis, you know, compromised the off season. Obviously Deami dealt with some injuries and then, you know, just the, the inconsistencies of being in the lineup, then not getting a lot of run, getting opportunities early. And he said that, you know, his confidence waned a bit. And that's, that's what happens. And if you've ever been an athlete, you know how important confidence is. And I've talked about just how big confidence is. And I can talk and speak to it firsthand because I was a big confidence guy. When my confidence was shaken, I was not the same player in any sport, basketball, football, baseball. And when I was confident, when I was hella confident, <clears throat> and I was more confident in baseball than any other sport because that's the sport I was best at. When I stepped up to the plate and I'm like, man, I know I can rock this dude. Like, he, this dude don't have nothing for me. I didn't watch a couple of the bats with him, uh, you know, pitching to my teammates. He ain't got shit for me. I'm about to go up here and light his ass up. You know, but then you see a dude and he's stroking it. And I remember playing against uh, uh, BJ Upton and Great Bridge. And they had, it seemed like they had a team full of future major league baseball players. You go into that game, your confidence is a little shaken. You see the, the, the pitcher stro stroking 93 up there and you've never seen 90 plus in your life. Shit hits different, okay? But, but when you're a confident dude like I am, you find a way to, to, to get to the place where you need to be to try to be productive. Um, you can see Deami getting back to that place. You know, you, you can see his confidence was shaking a little bit last year. Um, and you hear this a, a lot with guys in college. You go from being big man on campus to the low man on the totem pole. Just like that. I always talk about that with my kids. Like f going from middle school to high school, from elementary school to middle school. You just went from being the top dog at your school in the fifth grade, couldn't nobody tell you nothing, to now you, you are the bottom of the bottom. Now you're a sixth grader. And they're going to look at you like you're, you got three eyes, okay? Understand the psychology that goes on here. You just went from being an eighth grader and running your school to now being a ninth grader and being a freshman and you're a nobody, okay? Understand what you're walking into. That's kind of what you see with some of these players. You go from being big man on campus to, hey, you're just another guy, okay? And that shakes them a little bit. You know, you get in there, you're not making plays, you're not playing as much as you're used to. It shakes your confidence a little bit. So he had a rude awakening. Both he and Jamin Davis said last season was humbling. It was a humbling experience for both of them. But they both grew and learned from that experience. And that's the biggest thing, is you're going to make mistakes in life. You're going to have things not go your way. But how do you handle that adversity? Do you become a better person, a better player on the other side of that adversity? Sounds like these guys are ready to prove that they've grown and learned from their rookie season adversity. And I'm looking forward to it from De'Ami Brown. He said, uh, there were times where I just wasn't aggressive enough. I'm out on the field. And I, I told you guys that in the moment, there were games where deep balls were thrown. I'm like, De'Ami could have made a better contest for that. He's like, yeah, I got to go up with my hands instead of trying to catch it with my body. And so... Um, you know, we'll see. We'll see if these things translate or not. He feels like the reps he's gotten with Terry out you know, helped him, you know, as well. But we'll see. I, I'm all about that action, boss. So I'm excited to, you know, hearing from these guys and hearing how confident they sound. And, and there's a, it's a difference in their voice. The, the, the flexion in their voice is different. You, you can tell. I, I'm a big body language guy. I'm a big, you know, reading between the lines and, you know, you can tell when somebody's, you know, trying to sell you on the fact that they're confident, but they're really not. I got that sense from Jamin Davis and De'Ami Brown last year. I don't, I'm not getting that sense. I'm getting the sense that 
you know, they feel a lot better about their situation going into year number two. So we'll see if that actually, um, you know, finds its way onto the football field in a way that allows them to be key contributors for this football team in the upcoming season and moving forward. So day number one of mini camp, mandatory minis, a lot of guys spoke. I'm hoping that we'll continue to hear from someone each and every single day of these minis. Um, I'd love to hear from Scott Turner. I'd love to hear from Jahan Dotson and a few of the other guys that are relatively new here. Um, you know, Percy Butler. I'd love to hear from some of these guys kind of get their feet wet with the media. And also, you know, uh, as fans, we want to hear from some of these young guys, see where their head's at. Um, I'd love to hear from Andrew Norwell, see how he's acclimating himself. We heard from Trey Turner today. Uh, I'd love to hear from a lot of these guys. You know, I'd love to hear, you know, I love me some Bobby McCain. I'd love to hear from Bobby um, to see where he feels like this defense is and specifically the secondary and, you know, a, a host of other guys. And hopefully th throughout these next couple of days, we'll hear from other players as we wrap up the OTAs um, for the offseason and get ready to turn our attention to training camp. So uh, that's going to do it for me, your man, Louis T. Um, you know what it is. I'm a Washington fan, Edgeton Burgundy and Gold. My Washington spirit will never die. Washington spirit will never fold until we meet again. Post up and take command. Again, we're going to be live on Wednesday night this week, not Thursday. NBA Finals is on Thursday night, so I will keep that part of the calendar clear for you guys so we don't have to butt heads and compete against uh, game six, which is going to be epic. So um, we will be live Wednesday night, uh, 9.30 p. instead for the Command Post Live. Looking forward to chopping it up with you guys. We'll have plenty to talk about, plenty to chew on with minicamp and things of that nature. So I'm looking forward to talking to you guys. Also, leave it down in the comment section. Anything that you heard, anything that I may have missed, uh, Jonathan Allen also spoke, uh, talked very very um, a great lengths about the Jack Del Rio situation and, and you know really pretty much said look I don't pay attention to anything on Twitter or the people on Twitter uh, and you know so you know it, it's funny because I get where he's coming from uh, Jonathan Allen that is and at the same time I'm like these are the same people that you know you go on social media and you're begging them to come to the football games so Excuse me. Um, yeah, you gotta, you gotta kind of. It's a fine line you walk, you know, because, you know, he's like, I don't care about anybody else in, except the guys in this locker room, except the guys in this building, and I'm like, yeah, that's not what you said two weeks ago when you were practically begging people to come out to the games. But I get it. I know what he's trying to say. You know, when you get frustrated answering, this is why this Jack thing has to be buried. This is why we have to move on because. Guys get aggressive when you keep asking them the same shit over and over again about something they have no control over that they didn't do. You would be in the same spot if somebody kept asking you about something that one of your coworkers did that has nothing to do with you, but it's impacting you now and you keep getting asked about it. You're going to get frustrated after a while. So um, if you got any comments, leave them down in the comment section. Can't wait to read. Looking forward to chopping it up with you guys. And um a lot of excitement for this upcoming season and you see why when you listen to these guys speak you can't when you if you I, I, you can't tell me if you listen to logan thomas he spoke for nine minutes seven of those minutes the last two were about him being a dad and that was awesome as well but you can't tell me those first seven minutes that you weren't like pumped like man this is gonna be a great season like it's hard not to get excited but anyway i digress you guys enjoy the rest of your day. I look forward to chopping it up with you tomorrow night for the Command Post Live. Until then, you guys take care. Have a good one. Louis T. Network.